third in the four-part series of uh, Bill Minner's talk. I thought it was nice that we got the weather break this morning, <laughs> unlike yesterday morning. Three reminders, one new. Listen for the new reminder. If you're using a T-coil, please turn it on now. If, you're, if you haven't yet shut off your phone, you meant to, and you should do that now. And put it away even and catch your messages over break time. And third reminder, we're trying to make sure that everybody can be heard, not only here in the room, but on the film. So if you ask a short question, Bill's going to repeat the question. If you have a, if Bill asks for a comment or you want to make a comment and it's a little bit longer statement, wait for me to come to you with the microphone. That'd be great. And we're here to hear, uh, again, the title of Bill's talk, Agriculture, Small Towns, and the Federal Government, a look at the relationship over the years. Bill, thank you for being here. Thank you. Oh. That's good. Okay, let's. All right. Just wanted to make sure my clicker was clicking. Um, thanks again for being back, for coming back a, a, a third time. And uh, I, I had a chamber board meeting at 8.30 this morning, and I told the chamber board that they should be here next week. I wasn't sure if Judy was gonna, you know, shake them down for money or not, but this is a, I think they should. They've got lots of money because they're the chamber board, but we are gonna talk next week. Rick Ramsey was quizzing me, when are we gonna talk about the future? And I said, well, next week, the fourth session is when we're gonna talk about how small towns are surviving, how uh, rural communities are, are innovating, what they're doing to, to survive or to grow, and, and I'm going to ask you all for your ideas. So it will be less of a teaching moment and more of a community moment. So be prepared for that. And if you have ideas in advance and you don't want to get up and you know have the microphone pointed to you or be on camera, uh, you can go ahead and email it to me and you can get my email address from Judy or Janet or Mary bmenner at yahoo.com. Um, but, but I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I, I think I mentioned to you in week one that I'm working with uh, the state of Iowa wearing my Rural Development Council hat. I'm their executive director. And they're trying to come up with a blueprint for what small towns can do and how the state can help. Now, they also put the, the oh, by the way, we don't have any money, so your ideas can't cost anything. But, but. Um, which limits the possibilities. Here's an example. We talked about broadband at the, uh, at the end of the class last week. And broadband's hugely expensive to run fiber to small towns, especially in remote areas and down gravel roads. Well, it was pointed out to me that at the meeting for the Governor's Empower Rural Iowa Task Force on broadband, someone pointed out that, that as e-commerce increases and as the state collects more money in sales taxes on items that you buy on Amazon, there's going to be a, a moderate windfall. And what if the state collected that windfall from e-commerce sales tax receipts and put it into a broadband fund? Makes sense to me. Now I know that someone, someone else pointed out, well, there's a long line of entities waiting to get that money, so you know, get in line. But, but that's the sort of conversation that's occurring, and I hope it's the sort of conversation we can have next week. You all are a lot smarter than I am, and I think your insights and comments and ideas for the future, especially with maybe members of the chamber board around, or maybe we can lure the mayor here, or folks like that, we can have a real robust conversation. Not that our other conversations haven't been robust, but anyway, I'm, I'm happy to be back, and we're, we're actually going to get into the, the, the meat, so to speak, of real agriculture policy in the federal government, and the relationship between the government and farmers and small towns, and how do you preserve soil, and how does the farm bill work? And, and in fact, the farm, this is a really good time to talk about the farm bill, because there are four 
members of Congress who are supposedly sitting down today to start figuring out how they're going to pass a farm bill or whether they can pass a farm bill. And supposedly September 30th is the deadline. Well, September 30th is the deadline for a lot of things, like keeping the government running. Um, but there's also value in passing a farm bill by September 30th. And so we'll talk about that today too. And as always, if you have a comment, here is the holder of the microphone. So just wave your hand and Janet will zip over to you and we can have some comments. But last week we got into sort of the, the roots of uh, in, involvement of the federal government when it comes to utilities, the rural electrics and the, um, the REA, uh, evolving into telephones and now into broadband as well. And I talked a little bit about um, the challenges that rural places present. And I showed you the picture with the road to nowhere or someplace. I actually have a Jack Robertson photograph on one of my walls at home with a scene not dissimilar to this. And it was a picture I had bought after I ran for the legislature in 2000. And it was <laughs> to, to sort of re remind myself of, of the road I traveled, knocking on doors in rural places. Um, in the end, it didn't, didn't work since I lost. But, but that, that long gravel road to, to, to some place, someone lives down that road and they need electricity, they need telephone, and they need broadband. And how do we make that happen? Uh, especially if we need to, somebody needs to make money off that. And, and who's going to help? Uh, and, and what's the role of the government, if any? You know, can for-profit entities and investor-owned utilities make money off these rural places? And the answer is probably not. And if that's the case, who's going to make sure we get that, that service, those utilities that allow us to live at least on a, on a level plane, on an evil, even playing field with people who live in big cities? So we talked about the, the fact that cooperatives um, we're important players. And in fact, cooperatives come into the mix today as Congress was trying to aid and abet small towns and rural places and, and agricultural producers when they passed legislation in the 1920s, I think, um, <coughs> basically opening the door to cooperatives. And I mentioned the seven cooperative principles, but I didn't do a good job of explaining them. And so I thought this slide would take us back to the, these cooperatives. And this is, these are the principles on which every cooperative is based. You know, autonomy and independence, uh, economic participation, uh, democratic <laughs> operation, voluntary open membership, uh, training, education, information, uh, uh, cooperation among co-ops, and a concern for commu uh, community. And when I said that, that cooperatives were small D Democratic, big D Democratic meaning the Democratic Party, small D Democratic meaning more democracy in action, cooperatives are great models. And, and it was these cooperatives, again, that got us electricity in small towns and farms and rural places and telephone. And, and now, increasingly, um, some of the biggest companies in America are actually cooperatives. And I was showing this to my wife as I was going through my slides the other day, and she said nothing on this list surprised her until she got to number nine. <laughs> she said, Ace Hardware is a co-op? And I said, it's a cooperative of members. Members come together and work collectively. Um, but this shows you, I mean, CHS Inc. of St. Paul, Minnesota is a $30 billion a year cooperative. Lando Lakes, a cooperative worth $13 billion. So a cooperative does not have to be a small group of folks operating uh, at an essence uh, nonprofit uh, subsistence levels. Some of the biggest companies in America are cooperatives and are doing quite well. Uh, during our conversation about cooperatives last week, um, Darwin Copeman mentioned to me afterwards that, that a great model of the cooperative model was Grinnell Mutual. And does he have, oh, 
Darwin is way in the back. And I said, I'm going to call on you next week because Grinnell Mutual and that, that cooperative model as far as farmers coming together for insurance purposes was a great story. So I wondered, Darwin, would you share that sort of that, that overview of what Grinnell Mutual is all about? Thanks, Bill. Yeah, it, as a uh, graduate, if you will, of Grinnell Mutual, I started there in 1972 and didn't really realize what they meant to agriculture in the Midwest. But uh, Grinnell Mutual reinsured. So they insured all these county mutuals around the Midwest, some 800, uh, 800 or so uh, companies. My wife told me to stand up and I said, well, I am. You know, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, there, there are over 800 uh, county or farm mutuals in the Midwest. Grinnell Mutual, I think, right now insures somewhere in excess of 350 to 400 of them. What do they do? And they came into being by being a cooperative. Farmers in the, in the Midwest were finding that uh, Eastern Standard Insurance Companies, so stock companies, would not insure the barns and the buildings and the, and the property that they had. And so they banded together in small townships, uh, in county halls and schools, et cetera, to say, let's insure each other. And so they dug in their pocket, built up the capital for the, for the county mutual, and before you know it, you had, in Iowa alone, over 125 of these county mutuals. So as an example, in, in Tama County, they had three county mutuals in one county, insuring not only the farm property, but also in many of the small communities where, again, the stock companies just did not want to tread. They didn't want to go there because they didn't know about you know, tornadoes and cyclones and all the other things that uh, we've grown up with. Now, where does the federal government fit into that? Uh, really, the federal government has stayed out of the back uh, pockets, if you will, of the county mutuals, except for a positive situation. They, the feds have passed a positive tax uh, regulation, which allows the county mutuals to retain more of their income, if you will, to, to build surplus for the health of their, their members. Another aspect of, of Grinnell Mutual that, that comes into play with the feds is uh, Grinnell Mutual sells federal crop insurance, which is a heavily subsidized program that the feds help to make sure that farmers under some catastrophic situations, whether it's grasshoppers or hail or other catastrophic events, can continue to operate. So I'm a little biased because I grew up in the insurance industry, but I think Insurance and rural Iowa and, and the farmers that, that live in rural Iowa know companies like Power Sheet Mutual Insurance Company make a big difference in how they've been able to continue to grow and develop. Thank you. That, that, that's a great story. And, and it also kind of illustrates to me one of the, my Benjamin Franklin quote from week one, which is, we must hang together or we'll hang separately. There is strength in numbers, and in small towns, if we don't work together and cooperate and collaborate, we are sunk. And, and by pulling those farmers, pulling together, and increasing the number of insured lives that they have collectively, uh, and building a risk model that made sense, and filling a void that, that wasn't being filled by the, the big companies, they took it on themselves. And I think that's something we'll talk about next week, which is how can we collectively act together to create a strong future for our communities. So enough about cooperatives and the, the current day and modern America and back to Abe Lincoln and his decision to create the United States Department of Agriculture the same year that the Morrill Act, M-O-R-R-I-L-L -L Act was passed. Uh, I lived for a year at Morrill Hall at Ohio State. Now, the Morrill Act created the land-grant institutions. I know there's a Morrill Hall in Iowa State. I lived at Morrill Hall at Ohio State. Well, it wasn't called Morrill Hall, it was called Immoral Hall. <laughs> for reasons we won't get into. Um, that was also 1862. Um, the Homestead Act was 1862, providing land to individuals so they could farm, because you had this vast country that was being settled. And all the and, and I was rereading some comments by Tom Vilsack that he made on the 150th anniversary of um, of USDA. So that would have been in 2012. 
And, and he made the point, and I think I referenced this last week, that it was remarkable that, that the leader of our nation at the time of our greatest conflict was thinking proactively about the future and, and creating a Department of Agriculture and creating a series of land-grant institutions that were going to train not just farmers, but researchers who look at agriculture and, and botanists and agronomists. So, so here, here we have this amazing you know, man who is, who is making these decisions. Now, um, I have been, and, and as I mentioned to Art beforehand, my work at USDA focused on small towns. So the topic today is not one that came quickly and easily to me. I had to work for this material. And I did not realize that there were four eras of, of uh, public and federal involvement in agriculture. Uh, four eras. Um, the, the first one came right after the founding of the country, um, where the government was just trying to get agriculture um, settled uh, ensure that the frontier land to, to settlers was being used appropriately and that uh, folks who were migrating to America had places to live and to thrive. The second era became, uh, began about 1830, and that's when the government started to help those farmers nurture their crops, be more productive, uh, be more strategic, and find better methods for farming. And that includes this period where Lincoln is, is creating the land grants and creating USDA. Uh, the third era of federal involvement in agriculture was from the late 1800s. And at that point in time, Congress had to step in and start imposing regulations, uh, in part for uh, protecting ag markets, at the same time, because they were, we were facing this boom and bust cycle. Uh, there were years of great production that led to amazing surpluses and even more amazingly low prices to bust years when for weather or pest reasons, um, the, the surplus. So there were these wild fluctuations. And in fact, in the late 1800s, the government had to step in and start being strategic. And then the fourth era started in about 1933. Remarkably, right? With the New Deal. But let's just go back for a second because it wasn't Abraham Lincoln who first said our, our government should really be thinking about farmers. It was George Washington. And how, how many of you, just a show of hands, have ever visited Mount Vernon? Almost everybody. <laughs> Those of you who went on that tour saw some of the Washingtonian innovations in agriculture with the way he farmed, the way he processed grain, uh, the, the way he looked at, I mean, all, I mean, everyone gives credit to Thomas Jefferson as being this brilliant um, agronomist who did all these amazing things at Monticello, which is absolutely true. You don't often say to yourself, oh, well, George Washington was just like that doing the same things, but in fact, he was. And, and here he is, thinking about what the government needs to do and how it needs to operate. And, uh, and, and so we, we don't give him enough credit. We tend to jump to, to Jefferson or jump to Lincoln, but we can't let number one uh, go without some notice that, that we were thinking about him as a pioneer, a farmer, um, a surveyor. Um, and he was the one who suggested to Congress in 1796 that they create a national board of agriculture. So again, USDA created in 1862. 66 years earlier, Washington is thinking the same thing, that he wanted this board to disseminate information on agricultural practices. He wanted this board to uh, provide prizes for innovation. And here he was an innovator. And he had on his cabinet Jefferson, who was an innovator, and yet he was thinking broad, more broadly, saying, let's, let's have other people thinking about this too. Um, and again, his real, the real goal of this board didn't fully get implemented until USDA was created in 1862. So um, at that time, there were fairs, and folks would get together and share best practices. I don't think they called the best practices back then. 
but they, they've disseminated their knowledge and the changes and the ideas that they had in different ways. But, but Washington had this idea for how the government might help distribute that information more broadly. Um, between Lincoln and FDR, there, I, I mentioned there was a lot of activity and it had to do with the, the need to start regulating agriculture. Um, so I will run down a litany of bills and laws that got passed by Congress in that attempt. Uh, 1912, the Plant Quarantine Act was passed. 1914, the Cotton Futures Act. 1916 was a big year. It was both the Food and Drug Act, the Meat Inspection Act, and most importantly, the Federal Farm Loan Act. So there the government's getting into the business of making farm loans. Um, and in fact, that act back then in 1916 led to today's farm credit system. And the farm credit system today has about $300 billion in investments that it is making, helping farmers get money to buy land, uh, increase the size of their farms, buy equipment, um, by the inputs that they need to be productive. Uh, I, I think I mentioned in week one that access to capital is sometimes a big challenge in small towns. Some uh, community banks don't always have the capacity to make all those loans. Someone has to be able to step in and help provide that capital. And dating back to 1916, Congress decided that, that the U.S. government was going to be an important source of capital for, for farmers and ranchers. interesting along with Jim Crow along with well, here comes the microphone Tommy hang on stop that Jim Crow there <laughs> no um, just just interestingly George Washington Thomas Jefferson yada 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 all had slaves and then after the Civil War you you know then get into who you know who can farm who can own property just an interesting thought. You're exactly right. There, and we talk about haves and have-nots between rural and urban. We had haves and have-nots of the people who lived in rural America back then. Who had access to the money? Who was allowed to own land? Um, who was the government supporting? And we can have a, our next year we can have a four-part bucket course on inequality in America. Uh, and agriculture would fit in quite nicely. Um, but the Congress at least was thinking about this. It, there were already embedded systems of inequality, but Congress was, A, that was assumed, and B, they were at least thinking about agriculture. Of course, it was a lily-white agriculture run by 50-year-old white men. I take that back, 30-year-old white men, because they typically didn't live that long. But, um, but these systems were in place, and Congress was starting to regulate it. Whether or not if you were to have a, a debate between uh, a liberalist and a conservativist about whether the government should have been playing that role at that point in time, they could have a nice healthy debate. But Congress made that decision that there was value in them acting and the federal government playing a role. Um, here is after World War I. So those of you who heard my Herbert Hoover talk a couple years ago about Hoover's role in feeding Europe. During the war and in the immediate post-World War I years, those were boom years for farmers because they were not just, it was the, the guns and butter approach, the troops needed food, and Europe needed food because you had millions of Europeans starving during the war and afterwards. Herbert Hoover helped to get them food and feed them. After that, after the Europeans reestablished their agricultural productivity, and the war was over, there was a dramatic um, ag bust. Again, prices went down, um, stockpiles went up, and there were significant problems as far as um, the viability of U.S. agriculture. Uh, corn, at one point, after the Europeans got their, their food production back in line, corn prices so I'd say probably 1920, 
went from a dollar, corn went from a dollar twenty a bushel to uh, in 1917. So 120 in 1917, 26 cents a bushel in 1921. So a dramatic decline in the, the, the price of a, a bushel of corn. At the same, so, so farmers are earning less, and this, pre, this is before the, the Depression. And banks across the Midwest start to fail. So Congress steps in and starts to develop ag policies. One of the most important things they do in the 1920s is they create the USDA Bureau of Ag Economics because they decide we actually need people who understand numbers and understand economies actually studying the farm economy. And in fact, uh, the, the Bureau of Ag Economics still exists today. It's the Economic Research Service, ERS, of USDA. And they're actually in the news right now because Sonny Perdue, the Secretary of Agriculture, wants to kick them out of Washington, D.C. and into some other place, along with the National Institutes of Food and Agriculture. He, he doesn't want those two entities to be in Washington anymore. He wants them to be someplace else. I was quoted in the Des Moines Register as saying, well, if you're going to move it out of Washington, just put it in Iowa, because we've got Iowa State here. We've got smart people. We could be the, the home of that. But, but no one's quite sure why you don't want those ag economists as close to Congress as possible. Congress back in the 1920s saw real value in having those ag economists close by because they're able to influence policy. And the secretary does say we'll have a few economists close to Congress, but there's no need to have these people in D.C. But, but, but there, the Congress is starting to help address these, these crisis situations in the 1920s. And they didn't know what was coming. And in so in those first hundred days of FDR's first term, uh, and I, there, there was a, the, the, the frantic first hundred days, the amazing first hundred days, the first hundred days when FDR asked the Congress to address all of these problems that were coming out of the Depression, uh, including issues of, related to agriculture, and, and his, his team, and, and Harry Hopkins was not there yet, but his team believed that the depression had been caused by, among other things, the slowdown in ag economies. Farm production was helping to drive the depression, and FDR and his team thought that one of the first things they had to do was, was pass some relief for farmers. And uh, they created, of course, this alphabet soup and we have alphabet soups in the federal government today. We have the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933, the CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps, the FSA, which is not the FSA of today, the Farm Service Agency. It was the Farm Security Administration. This is a picture of an FSA um, worker meeting with a farm family in 19 sometime in the 1930s, helping them plot out how they're going to survive. There was the Soil Conservation Service. Of course, there was the REA we talked about last week, the Rural Electrification Administration. Roosevelt and the New Dealers are coming up with this litany of programs that they're hoping will help address the declines in the farm economy, help secure our food supply, um, help help feed those people in small towns and rural farming areas who were subsiding on next to nothing other than what they grew. And, and so those first hundred days included the AAA, um, which um, really, until it was thrown out by the Supreme Court in 1936, a, a significant piece of federal ag legislation. I was sort of looking at, I, so I Googled the, the words Agricultural Adjustment Act 1933, pros and cons. <laughs> you get a remarkable, again, based on whether you lean to the left or lean to the right, you have very different perspectives on the AAA. 
one of the, the big reasons that it was controversial is, is it was an attempt to address the boom and bust nature of agriculture. So you would then go from huge surpluses and low prices to great scarcity and high prices. At this point in time, in 1933, there was a lot out there. And the bins were busted, there were huge herds of cattle and, and hogs that had to be addressed, and so the government, in essence, paid farmers to either A, destroy their surplus, B, kill their livestock, to, to depress the, 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 the surpluses, and C, not plant. Now that idea of not planting is not, has not gone away. We have CRP land today that pays farmers to not plant um, crops, especially in the highly erodible lands, um, lands that really you should not be planting on. But, but the reasons for the, the AAA were not to protect land necessarily at that time. It was to regulate supply and to make sure that we didn't have these instances anymore where we had so much uh, in the bins that we were seeing 27 cents a bushel corn. Now, I have wondered in recent years, I digress here, um, when I watch farmers plowing under, you know, uh, buffer strips and taking out tree lines and going, planting from fence post to fence post, if they had been actually, if they had studied ag economics at, at Iowa State and had learned about these boom and bust times, because our, our, a, our producers, our farmers, are the most productive in the world. The, the, the seed genetics of today, whether you're pro-GMO or not, are remarkable. I mean, they're able to get 250 bushels an acre in a bad year when it comes to drought or rain. So they are the most productive in the world, and for that reason, it seems every year there's a bumper crop. So I, I just have wondered, especially having spent eight years at USDA, where you wonder about things like that, um, are we revisiting this where we're just producing too much, and can we be more strategic in how we plant, how much we plant, where we plant, and how we preserve soil health? So that's more of an aside than anything else. But I was thinking about that as I was reading more and more about the AAA, because it was an attempt by the government to, to step in and say, we have too much, it's not helping anybody. Now later on, the, the, the destruction of crops and of herds um, went more to let's repurpose that as opposed to destruction, let's, let's send it where it's needed. But at least in this case, the government stepped in, again, at a crisis point in, in early 1933 and said, we're going to act. Now, in 1936, the Supreme Court stepped in and said, no, you can't do this. And, and you may remember that, that, as this Times headline points out, it wasn't the only act that was unconstitutional. And Roosevelt's response was, you know what, we need to go from nine justices to 11, 13, we need more justices so they'll uphold my, my programs. They can't throw that away. Uh, but in fact, that, that was not the case. Um, and th so they had to, they had to sit down and, and Roosevelt and his team had to rethink, all right, how are we going to take the AAA, which is now unconstitutional, but there's still a great need for some elements of it, how are we gonna fix it? And, this, by the way, was United States v. Butler, 1936. Well, what Congress did is they quickly wrote a new bill, and it was called the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act. And we're going to talk about that in a second, but, but, but this is Congress basically acknowledging that there was value in some sort of government involvement in production, in, in conservation, um, and in somehow regulating the supply and well, eventually the demand. I, uh, I, have, I, I was reading through some Roosevelt notes. By the way, this, is, this was a 
newspaper comic strip. At the top it says, it's FDR talking, and the bubble coming out of FDR is, of course, we may have to change remedies if we don't get results. He's talking to members of Congress, his doctor's bag says New Deal Remedies, and then you have a sick look at Uncle Sam. And all of those bottles next to him are references to various New Deal programs. Uh, there you see right in the front bottom right is the AAA, NRA, CCC, FDIC. Um, so it was very, the, the, this whole addressing the depression was very much a work in, in progress. But, but at the time that FDR signed the second AAA, the Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act, he, he had this quote, and I'll just read it to you. Uh, Through these years, meaning since 1933, the basic principles of national farm policy have become clear. By experience, we have learned what must be done to assure agriculture a fair share of an increasing national income to provide consumers with abundant supplies of food and fiber. Barb asked, what's he talking about with fiber? I said, I think it's cotton. <laughs> to stop the waste of soil and to reduce the gap between huge surpluses and disastrous shortages. We have learned what we have must, must do. The nation has now agreed we must have greater reserves of food and feed to use in years of damaging weather and to help iron out extreme ups and downs of price. We are agreed that the real and lasting progress of the people of farm and city alike will come not from the old familiar cycle of glut and scarcity, not from a succession of boom and collapse, but from the set steady and sustained increases in production and fair exchange of things that human beings need. So there's, that's, that's a perfect rationale right there for A, the original AAA of burning crops and killing herds, but then the, I mean, in my mind, that, that's the rationale for a farm bill. In, 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 at least in the, the ag titles of the Farm Bill, which we'll talk about. I mean, FDR is making the perfect case for government involvement in agriculture right there. Because at the end of the day, our, our national security relies on the ability of folks to have that access to food. Because a hungry nation is a nation on the verge of revolution. And he saw that, and he saw it in 1933. And the number one issue was, how do we make sure that people get something to eat? Harry Hopkins took it another step and said, we can't just give Americans money. We have to give them a job so that they have a feeling of self-worth. There's an important element to work as opposed to just getting fed and just getting, uh, get, getting money from that. So, so when I think about those outcomes of the New Deal Agricultural Acts, and, and think about uh, what their lasting impact were, reading about them and seeing how some of them live, live on today. REA, again, still exists in the form of the Rural Utility Service. We still have crop insurance today. We still have direct payments to subsidize farmers. We have disaster money that provides help to farmers so that they can survive specific disasters. They all go back to 1933. And, FDR and the New Deal. And I know there were generations of rural folks who had pictures of FDR in their, their dining room <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, that, that those generations have changed and the views of the federal government in rural America have changed. And I'm convinced it's because they, government did not save them like they did folks who lived through it in 1933. So, again, I'm a big D Democrat. I have a certain view of government and how I think it can work and help people. We could have a robust debate with friends of mine about whether or not that makes sense or not, but it certainly made sense in 1933 and again in 1936 when this act was passed. I will take a second to see if anyone would like to, you know, 
chime in as far as their perspective on the philosophical views of government. LaForest, did you uh, want to? I was just pointing at the clock. Oh, okay. Were you pointing at the clock too? No, I was okay. pointing at the sign. <laughs> she, she's reminding me that it's break time. Actually, this really is a good time to break because we're going to get into the world of conservation in the Dust Bowl um, and Hugh Bennett and Soil Conservation Service. But this is a perfect time to just step back, refresh your coffee cups, chew on the fact that you're chewing on those cookies because some producer has created the byproducts to make those cookies and throw the wheat to help them. And uh, we'll come back in a few minutes. 10 minutes. Here on the right. And it really is. I mentioned that alphabet soup of uh, alphabet soup of, of New Deal agencies. Someone wondered if that NRA was the same NRA that we know today. And the answer is no. So it took me, uh, and I knew it stood for um, National, Recovery. National Recovery Administration. Hang on, I have to let it look at my face. Okay. <laughs> National Recovery Administration, U.S. government agency established by FDR to stimulate business recovery through fair practice codes. NRA was an essential element of the National Industrial Recovery Act, which authorized the president to institute industry-wide codes intended to eliminate unfair trade practices, reduce unemployment, establish the minimum wage and maximum hours, and guarantee the right of labor to collective to bargain collectively. So initially I saw that and thought, oh, fair trade practices. Now well, that's kind of boring. And then I read a little deeper. It was much bigger than that, wasn't it? So that's the big bottle of the NRA. There. Maybe that's why it's such a big bottle on that. It was a big deal. So in 1909, uh, there was a Bureau of Soils in the U.S. government. The chief of the Bureau of Soils was a professor, college professor, named Milton Whitney. And he echoed the sentiment of many people back in those days when he said that the nation's soil was, quote, an inexhaustible and permanent fertility. Such an attitude persisted into the 1920s, and after the crash of 1929, most people were more focused on putting food on the table than they were in discussing soil erosion. It wasn't until 1933 that the government took serious action, creating the Soil Erosion Service, Soil Erosion Service, and named Hugh Bennett as the director. And they granted funding from 1933 until June of 1935. So here's Hugh Bennett talking with one of his uh, counterpoints. Hugh is on the left. And that's one of his, um, I think, soil conservation co-workers on the right. Take care of the land and the land will take care of you. When I first saw the quote, I thought it was Aldo Leopold. <laughs> native, Iowa native, uh, and for the, whom the Leopold Center of Iowa State is named, great conservationist. But no, it was Hugh Bennett, also great conservationist. Um, so the soil, soil Erosion Service had been a direct um, offshoot of the, the Dust Bowl. Um, and yet, here it was, it was created in 1933, and it was, it was uh, created for two years. There was funding until 1935. And, and yet, even in 1935, Congress was debating whether or not there was any value to preventing erosion and having a federal role in addressing conservation, which you say to yourself today, huh, those members of Congress, do they really get it? I can say it. Regarding those questions are asked regardless of who's in power. I suspect they were asking those same questions in 1935 as they were trying to figure out whether or not to continue the Soil Erosion Service 
Um, but it was very much in doubt. And, and one of the debates was, there was, USDA wanted to take over the agency. And Harold Ickes, uh, one of the famous New Dealers in FDR's team, was the director of the interior. He had a different vision. He wanted to create a whole new de department of conservation that would deal with many things, including soil. So just after, two years after its creation, the, the, the Soil Erosion Service is the object of a beltway tug of war. And Harold Ickes was a powerful guy. See, it had Ickes on one side, and in reality, it had Hugh Bennett on the other side. Now theoretically, something was gonna come out of it if you have two guys like this fighting for some element of the same thing, but, um, but there were no guarantees. So, Hugh Bennett was asked to come and uh, testify before a congressional subcommittee on a new bill that would create a singular and permanent National Soil Conservation Service under the jurisdiction of USDA. So, the, he felt that the creation of a permanent responsive agency within the behemoth that is USDA would give it power and permanence and, and have the attention of both lawmakers and the public. So he had, as he's preparing for this testimony, he heard from somebody on his staff that in the Midwest there was a large dust storm building, uh, the same sort that would go on to define the second half of the Depression. And that this dust storm was moving toward the Capitol, toward Washington, D.C. And so he knew that if he could time his testimony just right, he would be speaking as the dust storm descended on Congress. So, and, and this is great theater, too. I mean, when you think, I, I, I think um, the, the, those of you who are familiar with the Bruce Almighty and Evan Almighty, there's a scene, the same thing with the flood approaching the Capitol. The timing of this was, was epic from a, a Hollywood standpoint. Bennett is, is finishing his remarks to this subcommittee when the storm that was moving east hit the Capitol and the sky went dark outside. The windows of the hearing room started to, to shake a little bit and some member of the committee, some member of the House said, huh, it's getting dark. Perhaps a rainstorm is brewing. Someone else ventures, perhaps it is dust. I think you're correct, Hugh Bennett says, it does look like dust. So less than a month later, Another terrible storm struck the Midwest, April 14, 1935, Black Sunday, and that was the storm that prompted a DC-based journalist to coin the phrase Dust Bowl. So the Dust Bowl really begins this day when the, a name was given to it. Um, across the Midwest, um, communities were impacted, uh, and between that subcommittee um, testimony of Hugh Bennett with the timing of it, with the storm coming in, uh, and then the, the following um, Black, Black Sunday, um, Congress was inspired to act um, on the issues of erosion. And, and the very next day, uh, the Senate passed that House Resolution 7, 7054, and FDR signed the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act of 1935. Go back to a, before the break. This was the replacement bill for the AAA. So the AAA is ruled unconstitutional. Congress reconfigures it to assure constitutionality, an important element of the government's role in farm programs in rural America is, is reset and includes this provision for soil health. And when we think about that value of topsoil today, um, and what farmers do to make sure that, that it provides them with the nutrients they need, whether natural or otherwise, 
we can go back to the 1930s and see that that topsoil was very much at risk. And in fact, it was Congress that stepped in with some Hollywood style um, um, influence uh, and do the right thing. Which takes us really to today and the debate going on in Washington on the Farm Bill. And, and the fact that the Farm Bill is the once every five year document that, that drives the discussion of, of farm policies, of investments, and the broad, broadly inclusive, uh, uh, what's the best way to call it? We'll just call it a document that um, goes on for five years. It's worth billions of dollars. Uh, and it touches our lives in lots of different ways. So the Farm Bill includes 10 titles. The only one I ever cared about was Title VI and Title IX. Title VI, so you have commodities, conservation, trade, nutrition, credit, rural development, research, forestry, energy, horticulture, crop insurance, and everything else. So you can see the, the wide um, scope that the Farm Bill has. Uh, in fact, um, again, I was going back to Tom Vilsack's comments, and uh, for a while, the, he was talking about the 2012 Farm Bill at the time. He refused to call it the Farm Bill. He called it the Farm, Food, and Jobs Act. Uh, because, in fact, that really reflects what's included in this. If you look at those titles, it's not just about corn, beans, hogs, chickens, it's about, it's about food, it is about farms, it's about jobs, because it's got that rural development title in there, and an energy title that benefits businesses in rural places that provides funds to, uh, in some element, Title IX, um, <coughs> rural businesses that want to make investments in energy efficiency or renewable energy, provides them with funds to incent them to be more efficient or to use new resources. So this, this, these titles, I mean, it really demonstrates the scope of what the government gets involved in. And if, we, if you look at that, I think you'll appreciate the fact that the debate, the, the debate that's going on in Washington today is over tiny elements of, of this farm bill and what it looks like. So if you go back to the last uh, farm bill, uh, or the Agricultural Act of 2014, you'll see that it's almost a trillion dollars. Again, these tend to be four to five year bills, and you'll see that, that nutrition takes up almost 80% of it. And it, that, that percentage has prompted a huge debate, left versus right, over should we be providing supplemental nutrition assistance to low-income individuals? Um, the Farm Bill feeds people who don't have enough money to feed themselves. And farmers, yeah, let me take that back. There are those who think that the nutrition title should be taken out of the Farm Bill. And the Farm Bill stands on farming and that there's a separate nutrition title. Tom Vilsack would tell you today if he were here, and he told Congress repeatedly uh, over the two farm bills that he helped oversee, was that providing nutrition and, and food to people who need to eat is a good thing for farmers because it gives them, it gives them business. It gives pe people who eat food help benefit farmers. And the more they eat, the better off farmers are. And if we can help people who wouldn't be able to eat otherwise get access to food, that's great for U.S. agriculture. But you'll see it's worth $755 billion in this bill, last farm bill. Compare that with 10% for crop insurance, and there's another whole debate going on over crop insurance and whether the government should be subsidizing crop insurance for producers, even those um, who own farmland and own farms but live in Manhattan and have 
million dollar salaries on their own aside from the farm operation. Then you have conservation practices and the six percent commodity programs, and then everything else falls into that one percent. All of rural development is part of a bundle of stuff that's only one percent of the farm bill. So what what is going on right now over the farm bill is um, House and Senate, Republican and Democratic um, chair ranking members are negotiating. The Senate has one version, the House has another. The House version has a provision that says that if you want to get supplemental nutrition assistance, you have to work. There's a, there's a work requirement for that. The Senate version doesn't include that, and Senator Roberts from Kansas and Senator Stabenow from Michigan are adamant that, that the work requirement piece is a, is a deal killer in the Senate. We can't pass a farm bill in the Senate if it has this. The House is saying it has to be there or we can't pass it. So that's why the, the four of them are getting together today to try to hammer this out. So you've got a trillion dollars hanging over this one tiny element. Now the, 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 the bills have other different differences to them, but this is the biggest sticking point is are we going to make people who get assistance to eat, or are we going to make them work? And I, I think that they, that they figure out some way to say that, that uh, someone in a nursing home who's getting Medicaid and getting SNAP, and SNAP is where they get supplemental nutrition assistance program. We used to call it food stamps, but there's SNAP benefits now. I think that they say if, you, if you're in a nursing home, if you're elderly, if you're disabled, you don't have to work, but everybody else has to. I think that the number of people they're really talking about is one to two percent of the total universe of SNAP recipients are the ones that probably have to work. And even the ones that have to work are probably already working. They just don't make enough money on an hourly basis to, to feed themselves. So, yes, uh, wait, we gotta get the microphone over to you. I'm over here, Janet. This is just, just to, to clarify. So 79% of the Agriculture Act of 2014 is nutrition. Is all of that then aid for those who are in need? Probably, or is, or probably is, not all of it. There are okay. other nutrition programs that come into play. So it's not all SNAP, but a large percentage of, of that figure does go to SNAP. Um, that's a good question. I mean, and, and this shapes our agricultural policy for the next five years. Is there another comment? Yes. Uh, the, other, the other slide referred to, if a, the bill is not reauthorized, they look back to 1949 uh, statute. What would that chart look like at 1949 that on? Oh, that's a great question. It was much smaller. Um, Certainly, the, the farm bill has, has gotten bigger and more complex over time. Um, in fact, where's, where am I supposed to talk about Tom Harkin? Yeah, we'll talk about Tom Harkin. Because Tom was the chairman of the Senate Ag Committee for a number of years. And he helped shape a number of farm bills. And he was able to embed in those farm bills a lot of great things. And one of the things that he's most proud of is Title IX, the energy title, which started to, as I mentioned, started to incent investments or assistance by the government in renewable energy and energy efficiency and target rural places. So, um, for example, if you're a farmer and you have a 1940s era um, grain dryer that helps dry your, your grain before you send it to market, um, it's probably wildly inefficient. And yet in wet years, you have to use those grain dryers for extended periods of time. You can come to the U.S. Department of Agriculture and get a combination of a grant and a low interest loan to buy a new super energy efficient grain dryer, replace the old one, put this new one in place, 
have it be better, more effective, and much more energy efficient, and save a whole bunch of money that you would have spent on, on energy and your old inefficient system. And at the end of the day, benefit your bottom line. The same thing is true for uh, business on Main Street. They could come to USDA and say, you know what? My front storefront windows are old and leak, and my interior of my business, my store is 50 degrees during the winter time, and the wind rushes in and I don't have any customers. USDA will help you with a combination of loan and grant. Um, replace your windows, your energy efficient, you're saving money, your bottom line benefits, and the rural economy benefits at the end of the day. Tom Harkin made that happen. And you, now the wind farms that you're seeing along I-80, east or west, north or south, are not necessarily happening with USDA. But if you drive past a farm and you notice a solar array on the barn, or a single turbine outside the hog barn, chances are that's Tom Harkin and his vision um, shaping the landscape. And at the end of the day, yes, it's about renewable energy, it's about not using fossil fuels, but it's also about being resilient and, and protecting the bottom line for producers in rural areas. So you say to yourself, well, what, you know, why is it in the farm bill? Well, because that energy title is focused on either agricultural producers or small towns who, as I told you in, in week one, are the bedrock for American agriculture. So how do, you, how do you make sure that rural businesses, whether it's an ag business, a value-added business, or a Main Street business are viable? You help their bottom line. And in this case, being more energy efficient is a savings every month, especially if you were previously using a 1940s era grain dryer and spending uh, an exorbitant amount of money every month, especially during the harvest, trying to dry your, your grain before it goes to market. So you think about going back to these titles. Every one of them has pages, hundreds of pages of programs and investments and initiatives and direction as to how the government's going to partner on these various programs, from commodities and conservation. For example, NRCS is the Natural Resource Conservation Service. They're the successor agency to the Soil Conservation Service. They work with farmers every day. And how they work and what programs they have in their toolbox to use are written in code right here in the Farm Bill. The challenge with the Farm Bill is that it does not appropriate money. It sets targets and it sets sometimes what are called mandatory money, but at the end of the day, the appropriators in Congress who are working in a different room in a different building don't always listen to what the Farm Bill members say. And they look at the Farm Bill and they'll say, well, yeah, there's, there's $90 million mandatory money in the energy program. We only have $50 million this year, so that's all we'll give them. Or yes, they put, they put a program in here that's going to require USDA Rural Development to have an undersecretary, which the current secretary got rid of, but it's up to the appropriators to put the money into the budget to pay for that undersecretary. So there's this, I mean, it's commonplace. You have policymakers on one side, you have appropriators on the other, and unless they agree, some of the things that wind up in the farm bill don't become reality for the very purpose that there was no money provided to create that. And sometimes we celebrate these great victories because of something that's in the farm bill, and then a few months later you look at the fine print of an appropriations bill and you realize, wait a second, I thought they were going to do that. There's no money for it. It's zero funded. So that, that's an ongoing challenge when it comes to members of the Senate Ag Committee or the House Ag Committee, and then you start talking to ways and means and appropriations. Everybody needs to be on the same page. It was a lot easier once upon a time when they actually talked to each other. And, and, and kudos to the Senate because the relationship between the majority and the minority in the Senate, and maybe that's just a function of the way that that chamber operates. They're more collegial, they collaborate more, and they really like um, 
unless you're talking about a Supreme Court nomination, they really <laughs> like unanimity. So the Senate, at least traditionally, has has sought for the, uh, and has fought for that, and uh, at least when it comes to the Farm Bill, the Senator Roberts and the Senator Stamina are trying to work together. Um, so the other thing about nutrition is, and I'm putting the picture of the beans up, is that it is, if you're a strategically thinking agricultural producer, you look at the nutrition title and say, you know what, that is my hook to get urban legislators on board with the farm bill. The long-term viability of a farm bill is guaranteed by the fact that there are elements in that that benefit urban areas. And if you're a, a, uh, an urban Democrat from New York looking at the farm bill, you might say, this doesn't affect me. None of my constituents will benefit from it, except for the fact that they may have a large number of folks that need supplemental nutrition uh, assistance. If you take nutrition out of that title, um, and as democratic, I'm sorry, as rural populations decline, and the number of rural legislators declines, you put at risk the future of the farm bill. So when people say separate the two, and let one stand on its own and the other stand on its own, in the short term that might be beneficial to you on your particular area of interest, whether it's farm policy or nutrition policy. But in the long term, if you look at how the Congress is going to change as our rural places get smaller, it's short-sighted. And that's why I think this marriage of these interests the potential existence of, of a rural platform on one side and an urban platform on the other is, is perfect. And if you if you mess with it, you're you're playing with fire. So th this th these roles of the federal government and agriculture, we didn't even get into crop insurance or direct payments. The reasons for that other than the fact that if we go back to 1933 and we go back to that 1936 statement by Roosevelt, how do we ensure access to food? How do we make sure that we don't have these bust and boom cycles? How do we make sure Americans have enough to eat? And I mentioned in our first, our first week, we are remarkably fortunate thanks to our producers and that we pay such a fraction of our GDP for food much less than anybody else. We don't worry about where our food comes from, for the most part. And what the government does is try to assure that for a number of reasons, including national security. But at the same time, that nutrition uh, title ensures that everybody gets to eat, or theoretically everybody gets to eat. So I'm happy to have a philosophical conversation in these last, is it really five to four? <laughs> I'm glad I haven't been looked 1118. I'm happy to have a conversation about where you think the government is missing out when it comes to agricultural policy, what you think the government can do better, or where the government shouldn't even be treading. Because frankly, there are people who say that there is no role for the government in certain elements like this. For example, telling farmers that they'll give them money to let their ground, their fields lay fallow, you know, CRP, whether you're protecting erodible lands or highly erodible lands or otherwise, um, that we shouldn't be helping somebody over here, possibly at the detriment of somebody over here. I mean, that's sort of the balancing act that comes with public policy, whether it's agriculture or not. Um, but frankly, when it comes to our food supply and the survival of rural communities, you saw forestry is up there. The U.S. Forest Service falls under the, the, uh, the Farm Bill and under the U.S. Department of Agriculture, too. It's, I mentioned that the USDA is like a giant ocean liner. The Farm Bill is a great example of that. Yes, you had a, a comment. Hold on just a second. Here comes Janet. Next week, we're going to figure out how we're going to get microphones to you all when we have our freewheeling conversation. I look at two things that are happening right now. Lots of flooding, especially in the agricultural area. 
and a lot of farms, a lot of area being burned. And we're, we're losing ground that we have had now. And it bothers me. That, now, part of that, the, the flooding and the impact of floods might be on decisions on where to plant. Um, if you're going to plant in an area that's in the floodplain or highly susceptible to flooding, you're, you're taking a chance. Um, and then the government may say to you, you know what, you've come to us for disaster assistance or you've used crop insurance every year for the last five years because you're planting in land that always floods. We're going to rethink those investments. But your, your point on the, the fires as well is true. And, and, and part of that has to be where are, where are producers choosing to produce? Are they in areas that are susceptible to, to forest fires? People that build their homes in areas that are deeply embedded in a, a forest, are they, are they making that strategic? I mean, my, the, the story that comes to mind is many years ago, I was working with a delegation of Polish government officials who came here because they wanted to learn about flood mitigation. And we went to Chelsea. And we visited Chelsea, and this was, let's just say it's 1999, so it was six years after the floods. And everyone in Chelsea still had their marks, their high water marks. Mm -hmm. And the mayor told us how the government had offered everybody the chance to rebuild their homes on the top of the hill outside of town. And only two folks took them up on it. Um, and then, of course, in 2008, Chelsea floods again, and it's going to flood repeatedly because they're in a floodplain. But then if you ask people to uproot their homes, that's a difficult decision. And at some point in time, the government's going to say, we're not going to reimburse you for those expenses anymore. You're making a strategic decision to stay put. In the case of these producers, they're making a strategic decision to continue to plant in a floodplain. Um, but let's also take it out a step and say, with a changing climate, those floodplains are getting bigger, and areas that weren't part of the floodplain suddenly are theoretically part of a expanding floodplain, and we do have less productive land due to climate change and severe weather events and torrential downpours like we had for a few minutes yesterday. But it's a great point. Yes? I'm curious um, if you've seen King Corn and if you could talk about uh, the farm crisis and how in the 80s and, and what kind of changes that may have had for um, how the government deals with, with farm support, agriculture support today. Honestly, I have not seen it. Um, and I was living in Columbus, Ohio in the late 80s in a little cocoon uh, in the big city. So in fact, I did not live through the farm crisis. Um, I can tell you what the impacts were on, on Iowa, which is you lost a generation of farmers. You lost a generation of young people who were going to succeed their parents or who had decided to go into agriculture and be a farmer who in 1988 decided that they were not going to do that, that that was not a lifestyle that they were willing to accept. And it's certainly the risk that, that the perceived risk in the post-farm crisis um, era was one that was devastating for the farm economy. And I think had a direct impact on the fact that farms are getting bigger now. Because you had those that had some capacity to aggregate land saying, I can do thousands more acres you know, with my equipment and my ability, and you lose five or 10 or more family farms in the process. So ultimately, the, the crisis led to uh, a shift in the farm economy and in the rural economy too. Um, but I, you know what, I don't know enough about how government responded in the 80s um, other than what I've heard anecdotally from folks I know. But I did see firsthand the long-term implications of, of that change. She's right behind you. Well, yeah, one comment earlier, the 1933 or time frame, that uh, it, was, it was common practice that the soil is 
we go on forever. You don't have to worry about solar erosion. And that seemed to be the, the, the mindset of many farmers today. Even after 80 years of soil conservation, education, and so on, that, that thought is still there. And just ignore it and keep on going until it's, it's all gone. I might suggest to folks who are interested in learning more about this, read a little book entitled Dirt. I, I also had seen, there's a great PBS story on the on Hugh Bennett and the, the soil erosion um, service that if you go back, if you have, if you, if you can get it online or through the PBS app, you can go back and rewatch it. It's fascinating. And it actually has the video of that approaching dust storm on the, the U.S. Capitol. Um, you know, the other interesting thing is, is 20 years ago, when I was working in public radio, I did a story for a national environmental show uh, about no-till uh, no and the values of no-till farming and how it was just starting to catch the attention of producers. There's still a huge number of farmers today who till, who till, till deeply. There are farmers today who refuse to even consider cover crops because of the cost inherent in cover crops. We know that cover crops have real benefits as far as soil nutrition and erosion control. So there are, and there are remarkable producers out there who are conservationists at heart. There are others who, who are choosing not to implement those practices for one reason or another. Um, and I think if you were to do a scientific study of their soil, you would see it's greatly impacted. We need to stop. <clears throat> Gosh, I haven't spoken enough this morning. Thank you, Bill. It's time to stop. We'll see you next week. Thank you all.